Hi everybody, just wait for a few more to come in. Just accepted from the lobby. Great, I think we'll get started. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. My name is Laura Hill and I head up Cloud Centrals here in the UK. And this webinar is part of our drive really to help our clients future-proof themselves against uh, the impact of, of content growth as they're adopting more and more of Microsoft 365. So today uh, we're going to look at the context around growth, uh, some of the challenges that that throws up, some quick wins to curb the impact of growth. Uh, but moreover, we wanted to look today at a much longer term sustainable strategy to manage growth. Uh, so the structure of our session today is going to start with some uh, some presentation of food for thought uh, for about 20 minutes and then we're also going to leave you with a, a bit of a demonstration for those with an interest in uh, more of a technology side of, of the strategy that we're going to talk to um, and allow a little bit of time for questions and answers so if anything comes to mind uh, any questions that you want to ask if you just pop them in the chat then we can uh, pick them up as we go or um, at the end of the session So for those who uh, don't know of us um, already, some very, very quick context. So we're a Microsoft partner around the area of content management. So we help organizations really mature their approach uh, to managing their content in Microsoft 365. So reducing the risk profile of your content, migrating into the environment and managing that content cost effectively. Um, but ultimately, opening up that content and the value in it so that you can surface it to your business advantage. And unique to our business is our in-house compliance team led by legal and risk professionals. So this team really helps our clients, I guess, kind of create the conditions for regulatory and risk requirements to flow down into the Microsoft cloud environment. So you'll find that our session today and, and all the sessions from us bring in lessons learned from, from that perspective as well. So if you're here today, I'm guessing it's because this concept of, of managing data growth in Microsoft 365 is on your mind. Maybe you've got a sense of urgency to tackle it, or maybe you're just um, sort of thinking further ahead. Uh, but hopefully you're, you're, you're thriving with Microsoft 365, your Teams has gone viral, everyone can work from anywhere and you're collaborating. Um, but all of that success in adoption inevitably means more content. You know, volumes are growing because of much faster creation of content. They're growing because collaboration itself often causes a much heavier data footprint, for example, from versioning. And chances are you're, you're centralizing more than you've ever done before. You know, unstructured data is residing now in this, this single cloud platform, whereas uh, previously it was perhaps much more disparate, much more siloed. And certain industries are seeing much higher file sizes as well, resolutions, uh, equality of things like imaging and mapping, um, et cetera, all adding to this growing footprint. And for many of you, I know you're still also gradually consolidating from legacy um, platforms, be them on-premises or, or cloud platforms that you're bringing into Microsoft 365. And for many organizations, it all gets compounded by a lack of what we would call active long-term retention management. So even in very highly regulated industries, we see quite a huge gap actually between policies relating to how long to keep data and uh, when and how to delete it and the actual execution of that into a long-term retention management program um, around content in Microsoft 365. And certainly in many verticals until relatively recently, actually there's there has been a keep all culture around data, which has just led to this accumulation and build up over decades. So that meant the adoption of Microsoft 365 took off for many with very few or even no uh, founding principles of retention management um, across the ecosystem and now it's growing. So what's the impact? Um, firstly, implications of this growth are 
cost. If there are limitations on how much data that you can keep in SharePoint Online and Teams, and organizations are hitting them. Uh, and it's it's not cheap to buy more space from Microsoft. So for Teams and SharePoint, you get uh, a certain amount of capacity per tenant and, and per user license that you've got. And there are caps on the number of teams that can be created uh, per user and per tenant. And there are limits per site as well, which can have instant cost implications, especially if you're about to migrate a lot of data in. And these limits might have always seemed quite uh, untouchable, uh, but in large organizations or very heavy uh, usage uh, of SharePoint, perhaps for document management systems, or where you're dealing in, in large file types, these limits are being hit. And migrations, of course, have a very significant impact on cost, um, you know, where all of a sudden you perhaps need to provision extra capacity, um, especially we see it around SharePoint where um, restructuring um, for the cloud environment means moving away from kind of deep vertical architectures to much more horizontal and shallow uh, hierarchies across your, your sites. So organizations seem to be finding themselves in kind of uncharted territory, really, of having to understand their data footprint in Microsoft 365, you know, understands what constitutes the new normal in growth ratios and, and casting projections on growth and be continuously monitoring this situation, um, which is a bit of an ever moving target. Second big area of implication of growth is risk. So the impact of this exponential growth is often a lack of control so we're in a risk conversation the more content that you have the harder it is to implement compliance controls to monitor them uh, to demonstrate compliance to regulators uh, you know the more data you have the harder it is to get visibility as well on the extent of your risk upon which to take action um, you know for example around data privacy if you if you're retaining personal information for too long and that lack of compliance uh, there can certainly have a, a significant financial or reputational um, repercussions. E-discovery process are also much more painful in unmanaged high volume environments and as such they will always cost more and of course data security issues heighten when data grows with that risk of, of data loss be it malicious, be it inadvertent, be it from the inside or, or outside attack, it all becomes more prevalent. And there's also an aspect of productivity uh, here as well, um, you know, concept of, of experiencing reduced productivity when that, that higher volume of content, more cluttered environments um, causes to end users, particularly around the search and being able to get your hands on content. So, What's the answer? Um, so in our experience, there's there's certainly not one single magic silver bullet here. What we would like to bring to the table today is some food for thought in four areas, because we see that organizations that are successfully um, optimizing their storage and minimizing cost and minimizing uh, risk across Microsoft 365 are engaging in tactics around some or all of these four areas. They are controlling their workspaces and, and that content at the point of creation. They are archiving to curb cost. They are cleaning up their data estates and most importantly they are managing retention in a, in a sustainable and a long-term way. And these four areas aren't um, they aren't sequential, they all sort of interrelate and we're just going to kind of skim the surface of them today. So the first <clears throat> factor we wanted to, to discuss um, was a, a kind of strategy to optimize storage around the implementation of governance controls from the point of creation of workspaces, so um, Teams and SharePoint sites, et cetera, and therefore giving content boundaries from the outset. So a key word here is operationalizing it. So implementing hard controls, but also setting uh, sort of behavioral expectations that guides content into an information architecture that isn't just one big open 
bucket. Um, I'm just going to pop a, a case study in the chat now of how one of our clients, Aspen Pharmaceuticals, tackled this. Um, but what we're talking about here is using tools to manage how, how teams and groups are requested, how they're approved, how they're created from the outset. Um, ways to guide the location and the named ownership of content, uh, wrapping content in metadata needed um, to ultimately execute on retention management when the time is right, and being able to just apply those compliance controls such as retention, such as sensitivity labeling and access control. Basically taking action so that those content lifecycle rules are already in play, at the point of creating content or provisioning the spaces to, to create content. Another tactic uh, is to optimize storage by archiving. So you might give this top priority if you are near to or already hitting quotas maybe in negotiation with Microsoft around extending your limits, um, or perhaps you're about to embark on a major migration project that will bloat your environment. So here we're talking about implementing a solution whereby you can start to ring fence data against specific criteria such as size, um, age, file types, and retain it elsewhere so that you can reclaim that storage capacity in Microsoft 365 and, and that content can then just play out the remainder of its life um, in a much more storage efficient way. So all the while ensuring you can access it, um, you can restore it, you can search over it, et cetera. But doing this, you will get very significant and quite quick wins from curbing that storage and um, uh, storage and cost um, in Microsoft 365. And we're gonna demonstrate this uh, tactic to you in um, just the last five, 10 minutes of the session today. However, um, a point we did want to raise was if you're if you're just concerned with archiving and not long term retention management that we've been talking to, um, you will just be moving that problem to another place, you know, granted a, a much more storage efficient place, but Archive solutions, um, for example, the, the AppPoint platform that we're going to show you shortly, it does offer very, very powerful tools for integrated retention management with Microsoft 365. So it's important to be thinking longer term around retention management so that you can tap into the benefits of all of that as well. You can, of course, Optimize storage by cleaning up. Um, the place place we started in this presentation was talking around governance controls from now onwards, from today, you know, that prevention of content chaos. This is about getting the house in order and, and cleaning up what you've already got uh, to minimize risk and minimize cost. And this concept of taking action on rot, so this redundant, outdated, uh, trivial content and it's really beautifully simple in, con in, in its concept um, but in our experience for many organizations this is a bit of a pipe dream um, because there are significant barriers there in terms of a lack of visibility of what you've got to even know where to start and also a lack of, of strategy around it so any decisions on cleanup will need to be grounded in that analysis of um, of the content profiling of that content and also uh, any action to be taken on it needs to be grounded on in a strategy um, as the, the basis as what you're going to do about it and there's certainly native Microsoft um, technologies, vendor technologies to scan Microsoft 365, scan file shares, scan other repositories and analyze what the data is, understand your risk profile. Um, sometimes if you needed it, very uh, deep content level analysis on ownership and sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. So tools out there to really equip you with the information you needed to scope a cleanup. But often the issue we see here in reality is, is sort of plugging that into an ongoing strategic program around retention management because any cleanup will demand decision making. Um, and, and so it's it's much more iterative and, and not a, a kind of once off project in our view. And if the other areas that we're we're sort of talking around today are not being tackled, 
this rot um, you know, will continue to be created. So definitely this is not something that we see can be tackled in isolation. And you can optimise storage by actively executing on your retention management policies and, and really enforcing defensible deletion across Microsoft 365. Um, and our role as a partner is to ensure that you are getting that value return from what's natively available to you in Microsoft 365, you know, really helping you understand how retention works in Microsoft natively. This uh, continuous process, I suppose, of, of adopting that um, and those features. So we don't want to go down a, a rabbit hole of how retention works today. In this session, um, we're going to point to some uh, resources available to you. We've got some um, blog content and, a, and a, a webinar session that we did recently to hopefully give you a bit more insight into uh, how retention works. But the point we wanted to make here is that it's really, really important to understand how to translate your retention policies into the technology, because you will be configuring controls within Microsoft 365 with absolute precision um, that really can't be left just to IT administrators to interpret. Uh, and also, you will have to be looking at not just that, um, that sort of trigger point, those rules for retention and, and deletion, but also how to operationalize and, and maintain compliance with the whole workflow around retention and deletion. So, for example, when it comes to disposition of data, you might need to manage that whole decision making workflow from review to authorization to destruction. You might need to intentionally be capturing specific um, metadata or any trace that you do want left behind. You might need to be keeping an audit trail and record keeping around the whole activity of destruction. You might need to evidence that to regulators or um, perhaps to honor contractual obligations. So this area is, is for us kind of where the rubber hits the road in looking at your ongoing requirements and creating your roadmap for implementing and monitoring retention management over the longer term. Uh, and yeah, looking at the the technology controls that you've got in Microsoft natively and your technology ecosystem around it. So ensuring any vendor technologies integrate fully with how you're using Microsoft 365. Firstly, you know that they don't hinder in any way your retention management. They're not overriding it. They're not obstructing it. Um, but ideally, they actually are helping it and complementing it. You know, for example, if you've chosen your backup solution well, it will help you in your retention management um, and optimizing storage, uh, for example, in the way that it handles levers data or in the way that it's handling the destruction of data and the right to be forgotten. And in all these, these four areas that we've just skimmed the surface of today, there are certainly technology levers that you can pull to optimize storage. But in all of these areas, it's important to understand the people in the process levers that also need pulling as well. Uh, you know, you will not be able to avoid what see, we see as a kind of process lever of having fit for purpose retention policies um, and perhaps also classification taxonomies as well. You know, unless you have got these things, there are often very few tactical technology moves that can be played. Um, you know, you can certainly archive to relocate content for cost efficiency whilst you make progress in other areas. But most initiatives will demand absolute clarity from the business on retention management. Um, and that's why our compliance team are very active in this conversation um, to help bridge that gap and, and sort of take your policies, regulatory requirements, um, risk assessments in whatever state of maturity they're in and get them technology ready, you know, get them um, prepared so that they can be flowed down with precision into Microsoft 365 and into your kind of storage optimization strategy um, and how you're gradually making progress on, uh, on minimizing risk. And part of being successful in that is getting the right people together uh, to land and, and sort of keep monitoring and progressing the, the policies and the execution of them around retention. Certainly some of the most impactful work our compliance team does is to 
sort of facilitate that communication between technical and compliance risk um, roles within an organisation to ensure that challenges around content growth are being tackled in a, in a much more holistic way, um, you know, not isolated just to technology driven projects. So wanted to, um, with that as a backdrop, hone in on kind of one tactical area. Uh, we talked about this quick win uh, that you can get from archiving on storage optimization. So the solution because it it enables our clients to build on the controls that they're um, by tackling the, the storage issue. So as a platform, it, it basically enables you to build very intelligent rules and filters to automatically take action on data, um, including archiving it to a different location, perhaps Azure, cloud storage, um, many other options, where you can then retain it in a much more um, efficient way with, with optimized um, storage, hierarchical storage, et cetera, and kind of move that uh, cost burden um, outside of Microsoft 365, thereby releasing that capacity in Microsoft 365, um, all the while keeping it seamless to, to end users. So. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Yaku, who is just going to give you a, a whistle stop tour um, of this uh, as, as technology, uh, and then we'll come back for any questions. Hi, uh, yes, um, I'm just going to share a pre-recorded just to make sure that it behaves itself. Um, just to mention while I'm busy sharing that, um, although we are, t we are touching on the rules um, around M365, Keep in mind that there are also um, structures in place to back up and remove things like uh, Azure VM, Azure File Share, Azure Blob, so saving space in that area. But we are not covering that today. We are covering specifically M365. So let me play that for you. Look at F1 Cloud Records and Archiving and how you can use that to clean up your environment, store information outside of your Microsoft environment, but still have it available. Um, so we're going to have a quick look at the rules. The rules then get some applied to custom terms that we create, and the custom terms gets applied to SharePoint sites or to uh, Teams or to mailboxes. So say, say, for instance, we are going to be creating an archive rule. I can either create a new rule or I can copy from an existing one. Um, I've got one rule container here. I can have multiple ones. I can define the object level so I can say do this to an entire site collection, entire list, uh, entire folder, or just one item. Um, then my content source for this, we are going to say specifically is SharePoint Online. You'll see there are multiple sources that we can be looking at. So for this, I'm getting to set up a rule. So it's very, very granular, or you can do um, everything specifically and do a whole site. But for instance, I can say when last modified time for this is older than one year, um, I can say remove the item and destroy. So we completely remove it from the environment. But we can also say include related records. So there's a way that we can define which records are related. And if you destroy the one record, it'll de destroy all the related ones. Um, you can include records that have been already been declared as records. You can leave a stub behind. So it leaves behind a little ASPX stub with the name of the file inside your document library. When a user clicks on the file, they will get the custom message saying that it has been removed. We make the stub immutable so that they cannot do, make any changes to it, no matter what permission level they have inside of SharePoint. Um, or we can do something like we can archive the content. So when we archive the content, we can leave behind the stub, which means um, uh, has been archived. So which the, what this means is we leave behind the stub for the end user. 
and we can also put a restore stub uh, for the end user so that they the end user can restore the file themselves now i'll show you what that looks like just now but what it means is it removes the file completely from sharepoint it leaves behind a little stub but as far as the SharePoint search and indexing is concerned, the file is still there. You can still search for the file. You can still find it based upon uh, all of its relevant metadata and then be able to, to restore it. Then you can also say um, it, you can archive it. And then after a certain amount of period, you can say if the archive date is older then, for instance, if you by law have to keep something for seven years, if the archive date is older than seven years, we can destroy it. We can also have an approval process um, where the users can manually approve uh, or a group of users can also, can also approve. Uh, you can send a notification to the records reviewer as well before it gets deleted, or we can just have it deleted um, once that's done we also have the option to export content after a certain period so now this is one rule that i'm building but you can actually build multiple rules you can build a rule that archives it for seven years then you can build a second rule that says uh go and delete the, the, it completely uh, remove it from your environment or you can say I export it before I delete it so you can export it into a zip file or there is file structures that you can build to export it to or you can even move it to a new location so you can move it to a different SharePoint environment um, once you are ready to move that out and the way we are doing this we are making sure that we are utilizing this AppPoint environment to make sure that our Microsoft environment uses as little as possible of our available real estate. Now, let me show you quickly what that looks like once a file has been archived. You will see these files that are archived. It, it shows as .url, meaning that this file has now been um, archived into the environment. Um, if I wanted to go, for instance, in here and delete the file, it will not allow me to delete the file because I've set the specific library that they cannot delete it directly from here. It has to be handled by the archiving tool. Um, and you will see if I click on a file and I, I want to go and open that file again, it'll take the end user to a recenter tab. Uh, showing them that they can restore it or they can export it. So if they export it, it will export the file for the user to use, or they can just click on the restore tab. What the restore tab does is it will show the end user that there is a restore in progress. Once the file has been restored, it will just show the end user that they can go and open the file. I'm just going to show you another one that I've already done. But it shows restore finished and very straightforward. It says, take me there. So when you click on take me there, for the end user, it takes them back to the library. And now you'll see that these files are normal files again that are available to the end user. And once they've used them and the, the file has now come to the point where that rule applies to it. So say maybe they modify it and within a year's time, with the rule that we were setting, it um, then again catches it. It will just archive it in the background. No user intervention required whatsoever. So this is the individual restore. You can also use the recenter center for administrators that you allocate. And in the recenter center, you can have a look at Exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint, Teams groups, where you have the ability to go and look at multiple information, to restore multiple information. Now, I'm specifically showing you SharePoint. Uh, we do the same for Exchange, for OneDrive, for Teams, for Groups, for Teams Chats. Um, everything works on a similar rule. And here you will see in my location what has been backed up and also what has been archived. So I can export it, which will export the file with into a zip file with a strong password that gets sent to you automatically by the system or i can do an in place restore um, if i look at this i can select one or multiple files just using my shift key and i can say restore 
and it will restore it back to its original location. The same with backup data. If a user has accidentally deleted information, it is not available in your recycle bin anymore, or you've deleted it uh, explicitly, it is still available as long as you have this backup data uh, to use. Now, there are certain rules that we can set around that. We can say that we want to uh, retain the information for uh, a certain period of time. So in your global settings, I can do things like I can say, where's my, my default load storage location? Um, if I want to have specific export locations, I can compress the data either from best or to the fastest. Encryption, I can use default security and profile encryption, or I can use bring your own key um, encryption which then is available to you. And in all of your setups, um, you have the ability to change the amount of time that you are going to be storing information um, that, uh, so that as you are storing it, um, it is available to you um, at a certain time. You can dispose of it based upon what your legal requirements are. And you can also see I can have containers, and for each one of my different containers, I can apply different rules. Very easy for me also to go and change the rules on the container to say, for instance, uh, on this container, I will only allow um, a rule that is going to declare this a record for this specific one, but then for your other containers, you can put rules either on site level or container level to say, I want to use this archive rule, um, I want to use this container rule, and it is all done seamlessly. You set your schedule, and according to your schedule, everything runs. It's a very straightforward process um, that is used by Fpoint, and it um, is very, very definable and very customizable for you to use. Thanks, Jackie. I've not seen any um, questions coming through on the chat, so I'm just going to put my email address here in the thread. And if you, um, if there's any questions um, after the session um, and any feedback, then please do get in touch. So, just to leave you today, then um, I hope it's been uh, useful and and given you some things to think around um, the the topic of storage optimizing. So. I hope also that what's come across today is absolutely there's technologies out there that can help you. Um, but from a, a partner perspective, we'd love to talk with you much more broadly uh, around your challenges around optimizing storage, your challenges around retention management. Um, certainly our compliance team are available to you if their session would be helpful to talk around your retention challenges and that um, that bridge that I was talking about between kind of policy um, and playing it out through the technology. Yaku and his team can also help um, if you wanted to explore the, the technology a little bit more around the Fpoint platform and that integration um, and why we particularly champion this solution. Um, there's also additional kind of services that we often um, work with, particularly when we are um, a, a new kind of client engagement for us to look at where you're at on your wider journey around compliance and, and retention management and really help you kind of take stock on um, where you've got to and create a bit of a logical roadmap um, for what to tackle when. Um, so if that sounds something of interest, then do inquire. And I know we're going to follow up with some additional resources from the sessions today um, around this topic. So we shall leave it there um, for today. Thanks for joining um, and have a good rest of the day.